the moment, we're in the laboratory. Now, most of the kits that we use, and the reason we use kits, be it chemistry kits or measurements actually uh, on uh, at the riverbank, uh, most of the time these kits are approximate. And usually, uh, if you bring samples back to the laboratory, you can determine what you're interested in much more accurately, much more precisely. However, um, I'm going to just demonstrate the use of dissolved oxygen because dissolved oxygen and pH are probably the two exceptions where measuring them in the river or in the lake at the time you take the sample is likely to be more representative of the conditions in that river or lake. So, this is how this works. Uh, what we're going to do is um, take a sample of water, not the sample we took from the river, this is just um, a, a tap water sample, and I'll take you through the dissolved oxygen kit. Obviously, there are different models of these instruments, um, some large, some small, but they usually have the same sort of components. First rule as ever, we record in our laboratory notebook what we're doing. And this is what happens when you drop your laboratory notebook in a river and have to pull it out again. Okay. So the date today is the 29th of June. And what I'm here for is laboratory demonstration of dissolved oxygen meter. And the sample I'll use is tap water. I'm not going to record anything else because we don't really need to. <laughs> Okay, so many different types. <coughs> Excuse me. So many different types. This is just one of them. And we have the, the main body of the meter. And we have the probe itself. And you can see that the probe, the dark colour in there, is actually in a, um, a detachable guard, almost like a, a beaker of water. I'm going to put that back for a moment. Um, okay, so the first thing we need to do, this is quite a large heavy cable. This is not a, a new instrument particularly, but um, nonetheless now, usually these plugs only fit in one orientation. That's it. And there is a locking ring here. Now that's actually on. I press the on button and you can see the meter just sits there for a minute um, doing various checks and the like. Um, it usually takes a few moments and then it will display the temperature and the dissolved oxygen concentration. Now, the calibrations are already in this um, meter and what's usually done is they are calibrated um, uh, beforehand and then the calibration, uh, unlike something like pH maybe, will tend to stay. If we were measuring pH, you would calibrate before every measurement. Okay, I'm now going to just remove this beaker there. And there are actually two probes here. There is um, a glass bulb probe in there. There's actually a conductivity probe there. And when one takes the measurement, one would normally just rinse the probe. And this is the laboratory part of me talking here, because you're, if you're in a river, you would simply put the probe into the river. And then 
paste the probe in the sample. Okay, now what we have now, um, you can see the probe moving around. Okay, so what this is telling us is that the dissolved oxygen saturation is 0.14, which is 14%. Um, if you think about this, if we were under a waterfall and doing this measurement, then the amount of dissolved oxygen will be much greater. And uh, one might have values of um, 0.9 or 0.8. Uh, this is uh, simply water which has been in the pipes all day. If we were to run the tap a little bit and then redo the measurement, in fact, we probably could do that, we will find that changed. Anyway, I will meanwhile, um, we have a variety of um, measurements here. I won't bore you because all the meters are different. We've got the uh, saturation, we've got the percent dissolved oxygen, we've got the temperature and various other components there, and the pH 7.57. I'm going to take this out for a moment and replace it here. I'm going to record, as I only have one set of hands, the dissolved oxygen. And that's all I'm actually interested in. I'm not really interested in the pH. And now I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to increase the amount of dissolved oxygen by 0.5. Basically mixing the water up a little more. And what we should find now, when we do this measurement, is the value should be above, I hope, 0.14. And indeed, we're up at 0 0.24, 0 0.23, or slowly fall as 0.22 as the oxygen in the water re equilibrates with the atmosphere. Anyhow, so a quite straightforward piece of equipment to use, but a lot of information that can be got out of here by one simple measurement or one simple piece of kit. Temperature, dissolved oxygen, in this case, pH as well. Okay, we could have done this by the river, but it was hot, there were many biting insects, and we chose to do it here. But the advantage of all of this sort of equipment is that it allows you to do a measurement, in the case of dissolved oxygen, a rather good measurement, and quite characteristic measurement at the time you take the sample. If this were our river sample and we'd have waited to come here to do the measurement, the dissolved oxygen measurement would bear no relation to the dissolved oxygen present when we took the sample. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on. Okay, Simon, I have, a I have a question. So maybe we'll do it like a small conversation as we are recording it. Of course. Uh, this instrument reminds me of a pH probe where the sensor needs to be stored in some liquid. Could you elaborate why are we using certain liquid there? Could it be pure water, distilled water or saline? Which is the best and why is it so? Um, okay, you're actually completely correct. I, I'll look at this. I'm wearing a Google Glass, so basically you should see what I'm seeing. And you can actually see that that is a pH probe. That is why you have liquid here. Now, yes, you can store pH probes in water, um, but to do so, this is boring chemistry, it's good short term, it's not good long term because the electrolyte then diffuses out the electrode. Um, so this will be a, um, a saline or a buffer solution I see. Uh, to prevent that problem. Okay. Anyhow, right. All right. So, if it was stored in air instead of saline, there won't be uh, any diffusion of ions, isn't it so? Right, then there is a different problem. Um, I can't, I'm looking round to see, and I can't see any in the lab. Any laboratory, you'll find old pH electrodes. Because if you dissolve, if you uh, store them dry, which you must never do, two things happen. Three things happen. 
The first is that the electrolyte will evaporate out of the electrode. And these electrodes are combination. You have a reference electrode inside the glass electrode. Mm. That prevents the reference electrode working. In fact, it destroys it so that the um, potential difference that this probe gives from which we get the pH uh, would be fairly meaningless. Secondly, um, the uh, glass itself Without being complicated, it's not just any old glass that you use for your window that you make a pH probe out of. It's quite a, a careful glass with careful permeability. When you get um, crystals forming on the glass, you can actually disrupt the surface of the glass, which again, even if your reference electrode is working, uh, will damage the glass and therefore compromise the reading that you're taking. Mm. Wow. So. Could Air storage is certainly more convenient, <laughs> but a good deal more destructive. I see. I'm thinking that could there be some rusting of the electrode because now there's no degree and air, the oxygen there could do some oxidation there? Um, rusting, you need um, iron or something like that to actually rust. The, the electrode is fabricated from glass. There's a platinum, platinum oxide electrode in a uh, uh, counter in there or there's a probably a standard calomel or standard silver silver oxide electrode so rust they don't rust in that sense of the word okay so. sorry i got one silly question though if you don't mind no question is ever silly <laughs> okay uh for the electrode why can't we just use pure platinum why is it always combined with some form of platinum oxide okay um When we are very used to using electrodes um, to do, for instance, pH measurement, and unfortunately it's made us a bit lazy because we just have one probe. If we were to go back 20 years doing a pH measurement, we'd have two probes. Mm. One would be the pH electrode and the other would be a reference electrode, and they used to be separate. I'm yeah. an old git, got great hair, so <laughs> I remember those. Um, the reason is because any of those um, electrode measurements are electrochemical measurements, which means you're looking at a potential difference between two electrodes. You have electrons moving uh, through the electrolyte from one electrode to the other to make a circuit. In the same way that, well, this is a bad example, but one could have a light bulb, a battery with two wires, and once you've completed the circuit, the light bulb will shine because the electro electrons are running through the bulb. Well, the electrolyte, the liquid, makes up the circuit connection, which then allows the electrons to go between the electrodes. So it's not as straightforward as we think. In fact, you've got... Um, equilibrium electrochemistry going on and that's the basis of a whole load of analytical techniques single ion electrodes of which a pH electrode is one of them um, yeah there's a bundle of them and they look simpler than they are thank you thank you Simon pleasure